A lot of words get thrown around by people frustrated with our politics, socialism, fascism, communism, things like that. They're all essentially the same thing. And to understand what's hurting us today, we need to understand what socialism is. A lot of people have said, Obama, President Obama is a socialist. Well, you can't really say that unless you can define socialism. And that's the biggest problem. So in this book, The Naked Socialist, we have the complete story of socialism, what it is, where it came from, what it's doing to us, and what we will end up becoming if we don't find a way to put a stop to these movements. Now, socialism is as much a concrete, real thing as it is a perspective. So we have basically two parts. We have the, the dream, the utopia, the promise, saying, oh, if you'll just let government be in charge, look at all these beautiful things we can give you. But the reality, the reality of socialism has always been misery, death, destruction, decay, and all the problems and the misery of the humanity that history records. So here in The Naked Socialist, you will find presented 10 basic principles. And I wanna just, 10 basic ideas. I would just wanna show you, it's on page X right here at the beginning of the book. How to read this book. First, you're gonna get the basics. You're gonna learn about the seven pillars of socialism. And that's the ideas that have shown up throughout history under different names, not just socialism. That's a modern name, socialism. We've used that since about the, the early 1800s. But the seven bad ideas have always been here. And those include an all-powerful ruler that's always present. That can be an individual or a group of people. The second part of socialism and a socialist society is, is the people are divided into castes or classes. There's always an elite class that supports the ruler. There's a middle class that enforces all of the ruler's dictates. And then there's the workers, the peasants, the slaves at the bottom. That's in every single socialist type society. Now, to stay in power, the rulers have to make certain promises and they say, we're gonna make things more fair, equal. We're gonna level it out. We're gonna take from the haves. We're gonna give to you the have nots that are suffering so much. So that's the third pillar is to make things in common. Never works, never has worked. But to make things in common, they require a degree of control. So all parts of life must be regimented, and that's number four, regulating every aspect of your personal life and your uh, economy and your money. And then in order to bring about this regulation, these governments have to have force. That's number five, the force to be able to impose their will. The people do not have the ability to resist. They must comply or prison or death. Number six is the control of information. Socialists always get a hold of the media. They always give out ideas and things to lead the people to believe certain things are as they claim they are. And today we have all kinds of manufactured information to lead the American people to believe our society is going one direction when it's not. And then number seven, the seventh pillar of socialism is no unalienable rights. The only rights you have are those dictated by the government. This allows the government to give you certain permissions and take away certain permissions. Total top-down control. So with those seven ideas, we go through and we read about those in the first section. Now, now that you know these seven bad ideas, you can see them in history. You open up your history books and look back, go on world tours, go see these ancient lands, learn about the cultures and discover for yourself that these seven bad ideas have been at the base, at the root of the destruction of civilizations for the last 6,000 years of recorded history. Religion, is there socialism in religion? Yes, there is. In what form? So we talk about the inquisitions and the crusades, we talk about Islam, and how the government and the people's private culture have become mixed together. And so if you break a law, you're also breaking God's law or vice versa. And it's, it's, uh, it's a tough, nasty part of life that socialism has brought about. The next is we talk about the miracle that finally brings socialism to a stop. And that was our constitution. 
The founding fathers were students of history and they looked at these patterns and principles and violations of principles. They said, it's not gonna happen here. So they wrote into the constitution specific mechanisms to abolish all seven of these pillars of socialism. Unfortunately, the people did not, American people did not stay true to that and they went ahead and began to allow corruption to come into their constitution. So here we go, rest of the book. The revolution of the socialists. What happened? How did those top government consolidated power people begin to violate and break down the constitution so they could have control over us? And as we look at those different instances, we see it in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court deciding against principles of freedom. We see, we learn about unions, how a union is socialism in the workplace. We learn about law schools, about bad amendments. We'll talk about amendments for just a second. Uh, we've heard about the 16th Amendment that allows the government to get into your wallet and take income taxes out directly. And that's a big, long discussion. We learn about the 17th Amendment that allowed people to elect their senators directly. And the reason that's a problem and the reason the founders did not set it up that way is because who can talk to their senator, drop in the office in DC or call them on the phone and say, I don't like the way you voted. None of us can. Senators have all their helpers. Well, the founders knew that. They didn't want to have more emperors, two for every state at that level. So they set it up so that our state legislatures would hire and could fire the senators. Now your state legislator, you can go down to his or her office, you can have lunch with them, um, go to church with them, they're your neighbors. You can go see them and talk to them and say, I don't like the way my senator voted. And your state legislator can listen and say, you know what, I agree. I'll go on Capitol Hill and we'll talk, talk it over. And that person does. At the next legislative session, they say, our senator sure has been voting strange. So they call up the senator and they say, sir, ma'am, you're fired. We're going to replace you with someone else who better represents our views. That's the power. Today, is that there? No. Today, you've got to wait six years. And then an enormous uh, campaign advertising that emphasizes certain positives ignores the negatives and this huge machinery rolls forth and senators stay in power simply on the popular vote. People who are generally disinterested except for singular issues and people who sit back and say, well, you know, it's been okay, I'll vote for him and they do. And these people stay in for ages. That's a key part of representation that we lost with the 17th amendment. And that's part of the revolution of the socialists here in the United States of America. So that's something we need to return to. Anyway, welfare is uh, one of the last nails, not the final one, where government starts to provide all these checks, paychecks and, and uh, help and aids to the population. When people are out of work or they're sick or they're destitute or they didn't save, they didn't prepare, they lean on the government. Do you think those individuals are gonna vote against the government to have those things abolished? No way. That's how socialism works. You make the people dependent and then they continue to vote to keep you in power. Welfare is one of those tools. Uh, next one in here is the money. How does socialism finance itself? Well, it's called, and I call it in here, uh, the socialization of our money and that's when the control and the responsibility of our money was turned over to a private institution, the Federal Reserve Board. That word federal gives it a sense of being part of the government. It's not, it's private. And it's been owned and controlled by private people for a long time. It's full of corruption. They're the ones that perpetuated and lengthened the Great Depression. They came in and they promised let us take care of the money and we'll keep a nice even keel on the economy. They've been responsible for enormous recessions and near depressions after, since the Great Depression. So bad idea. 
but that's part of the whole socialism movement. So that's the next one. Then we go to U.S. presidents. I took a sampling of not all the presidents, but just a couple of dozen that instituted socialism into our culture and our government. And I show you how they did it, what acts they pushed through Congress, and how they made changes to socialize this nation and destroy constitutional freedoms. World socialism is next. How have nations that have embraced socialism to a greater degree than the United States, how have they fared? Not well at all. Everybody loves to point at Sweden. Oh, look at Sweden. Well, I talk about Sweden in here. They have a trillion dollar national debt with only nine million people in the country. How do nine million people accumulate a one trillion dollar debt? If socialism worked, they shouldn't have any debt at all. So read all about it in that section. And then the last part, number 10, is restoring freedom. In this section of the book, I lay out the exact reasons why socialism is hard to get rid of, but how we do it. And it's probably a little bit different answer than you're accustomed to, because it does not have anything to do with changing the White House or Congress immediately. That, of course, has to happen, but that's not the beginning place. And I share that here in the end of the book. It looks like a good hefty book, but it's extremely, extremely fast read, nice big print so you can see it. And then all the way through the book, at the very bottom of each page, you'll see what I call a little factoid. And these are just little uh, uh, comments, excerpts, statistics, absurdities about socialism and freedom and why the two will simply never mix. And so that's on every page, has a good index. And as, as you go through this book, you will come out at the end of it, understanding once and for all, what is socialism? Is President Obama a socialist? You'll now be able to answer that question with reason, not just opinion. And then you'll be able to look at headlines and look at candidates. You'll know the right questions to ask and you'll understand why our constitution was so brilliantly structured and crafted to prevent this kind of nightmare coming to the United States of America.